Hey guys, how's it going? I just want to talk more about the atonement and these different theories and some different stuff. I was looking up researching a lot last night online and looking up YouTube videos and there were some helpful videos. And uh, first of all, it's almost like the theory of the atonement kind of has some impact on the gospel. A lot of people are Calvinists or others may say that the penal substitutionary atonement is the gospel. Um, you know, we usually think of the gospel as Jesus died for your sins. Okay, like he took the punishment for your sins. See, the penal substitutionary atonement, I guess it was really uh, kind of came about by the reformers, Martin Luther and John Calvin. And, uh, you know, I don't know if that's really where it started to evolve or what, but and it became kind of popularized by Jonathan Edwards, I guess, uh, from his book or his sermon or whatever, The Sinners in, a, in the Hands of an Angry God. And, you know, it has a lot to do with God's wrath. And, um, you know, so the, the penal substitutionary atonement kind of has to do a lot with God's wrath, whereas it would, I think, from my understanding, the... The sacrificial theory of atonement has a lot to do with God's love, and the gospel is supposed to be about God's love. But, and um, people who believe in the penal substitutionary atonement may say that the sacrificial theory doesn't do God justice, because they say, you know, we see in the scripture that there's a penalty for sin. And so even those of us who are believers who are born again before we were born again we were born as sinners you know we were born with a sin nature and we committed sins and we still commit sins after we're saved but these sins uh, are deserving of punishment okay this is really the uh, like the framework for the penal substitutionary atonement it's like that sin deserves punishment and that you know because we were sinners, because we have sinned, we are deserving of punishment. But Jesus took our place, and he took our punishment, so those who are believers in him, uh, his, his sacrifice, um, he covered all the punishment uh, for those who believe in him. And so, I mean, there's a lot more that needs to be a lot more thought about, thought out about this, but... And then the sacrificial theory kind of has to do with God's honor. It's saying that when we sin, and because we're sinners, we're robbing God of his honor. Okay, we're supposed to be perfectly obedient to the Lord, to God. And because of our sin, we have robbed God of his honor, and we owe him. We are now in debt to him because of our sin and because of robbing him of his honor. And then Jesus, you know, God became a man, you know, took on humanity, and he uh, lived a perfect, obedient life. And so he gave, you know, abundant honor to the Lord, to God, the Father. He lived, you know, a perfect life of obedience and uh, perfectly, you know, followed the will of God. And so, therefore, um, because of his perfect obedience. Uh, he makes up the debt that we owe to God for us robbing him of his honor. And uh, and so, I don't know, I said, maybe I've been saying sacrificial <laughs> because I haven't been away from it for a second. I mean the um, satisfaction, <laughs> two different things satisfaction theory and the satisfaction means uh, you know paying a debt is what it's supposed to mean um, so so Jesus paid our debt of owing God honor and uh, and so there's no punishment due uh, to him obviously because he's innocent he lived a perfect life and so the whole idea of the, the penal substitutionary atonement that Jesus took our guilt an innocent man took our guilt and was punished for it, our guilt, I think it's completely absurd, and I don't think it's what the scriptures teach. I've also learned a bit about the ransom theory. Well, I watched a good video if you if you look up the uh, satisfaction theory of atonement. 
which I can't believe I've mistaked that the whole beginning yeah. of this video, but the satisfaction theory of atonement, and um, this guy goes over different theories. It's kind of a short video, and he, he kind of described them. And uh, he, he first said that there's, you can categorize the theories of atonement basically into two categories. There's subjective theories, and then there's objective theories. And I think that if I'm getting this right, the subjective theories are the ones like the moral influence, where they say that Jesus just died on the cross to be an example to us, that we're supposed to be self-sacrificing and we're supposed to uh, be obedient to God and such. But it really didn't have any real effect on, you know, forgiveness of our sins or covering us or being, you know, propitiation or whatnot. So the subjective theories of the atonement are just, you know, Jesus was just a good example to live by. And so I think that's, uh, I think it's a lot more than that. And the objective theories is where the penal substitutionary atonement and the satisfaction theory fall in place. And then there's the ransom theory, which some people believe in. From what this guy explained it as, is the ransom theory is basically that Satan uh, holds people captive in their sins. And when Jesus died on the cross, um, well, basically that, Jesus, that Satan had some kind of some power over men to hold them captive. And that God kind of tricked Satan by becoming a man, by taking on humanity uh, as Jesus and dying on the cross. Um, so... Satan put him to death, but because he was fully man, but also fully God, then Satan overstepped his bounds, and so Satan had to uh, give up some of his powers, I guess, uh, because he overstepped his bounds. And so, therefore, when Jesus died on the cross, he defeated Satan in that sense, and uh, men were free from, uh, freed from the, the bondage of Satan and sin, I guess, but there's still like a having to work uh, for your own forgiveness of sins. Uh, so I think there's kind of a work salvation involved in the ransom theory. And I know that holding firmly guy who's dead now, who's made a lot of videos, he taught that. And I was looking at a video Kerrigan Skelly put out that he rejects penal substitutionary tone. <laughs> which is somewhat decent video, but I don't know what he believes. There's also the moral government theory, which I know Jesse Morrell believes, and that's basically a work salvation type thing, too. And uh, the satisfaction theory, you know, is what Catholics basically believe, and, you know, they believe in, like, work salvation. But I don't know if the satisfaction theory really, uh, if any of that's really implied in there. Um, but, you know, it sounds pretty good to me. Um, the, it was one of the later developments before the penal substitutionary atonement. Uh, so the penal substitutionary atonement view is pretty recent. And so, um, so yeah, the gospel, I think, to a lot of people, and kind of even what it's been to me, and I need to rewatch my gospel videos and stuff, is, you know, a lot of people say that because you're a sinner, you know, you're deserving of punishment, but, you know, God loves you so much that his son took the punishment for you, basically. And I think that that's false now. So it's kind of understanding, you know, what really is the gospel. Jesus did die for us, though. I mean, he did. He was a substitute for us. There's no doubt about that. You know, and we are uh, we are deserving of punishment and, and guilt. Uh, but is it... Uh, you know, is it because we broke God's law, or is it because we robbed God of his honor? You know, I think that might be kind of the issue that's at hand. And, and I guess that uh, John Calvin is a lawyer, and so a lot of his legal ideas he may have put into scripture. I just think that examining a lot of the verses that people use to support the penal substitutionary atonement don't line up. I've already went over a handful of those. There's still some more that I could go over. Like Jesus talked about, you know, drinking from this cup, you know, um, that he'll drink of this cup. And people say that that cup is God's wrath that he took on the cross, but I think that's false. And so I want to go over that. There's other verses as well, but I went over some in Isaiah, like Isaiah 53 and such. I guess there's also this idea of justice because, uh, like the penal substitutionary atonement, believe the people who believe in that. They believe that um, 
that that view is what gives God justice because sin deserves punishment, and there, there had to be a punishment paid for that. And uh, they think of pun they think of justice as you know today mostly what we think of justice as is um, like righting a wrong or uh, like you know somebody paying for what they've done. Okay, like. A criminal being captured and arrested is justice to us, right? And and I guess maybe the Hebrew idea or the Old Testament or the Bible view of justice, and there may be some verses that support this, is um, to, I have to think about this for a second, <laughs> but justice, justice is basically to do good deeds or to do what's right, um, I'm not really getting this across right the right way. But as believers, the Bible says that we, we are to do justice. And, um, but also Jesus says that we are to love our enemies. And see, if we think about justice as punishing those who deserve it, then, you know, we'd be punishing our enemies. But Jesus said to love our enemies, and we are to do justice. And so I think that justice is, um, there's maybe a different view of justice that the penal substitutionary atonement is doing, giving it. So there's just a lot more that needs to be looked into this, but I just think that I can pretty much up front just cancel out the penal substitutionary atonement, which is crazy because I know that's what a lot of people believe. It's the common belief. But examining it in scripture, it just doesn't hold up. It just doesn't make sense that Jesus became a sinner or that someone who was innocent was punished. Um, it doesn't make sense that the father would punish the son. It's like, um, you know, a person within the Godhead punishing another person within the Godhead. And it's like there's this division or opposition within the Godhead. And, uh, and all this doesn't make sense. Um, so I think there's got to be other ways to look at it. Like I said, the satisfaction theory seems pretty good. I've also, I've got books on, um, you know, doctrines of the Bible and stuff that I need to look into and see if they got anything on here. Um, like Norman Geister's book on theology, I'm sure that he probably supports the penal substitutionary atonement. Which I've actually got sitting over here, but the systematic theology. I need to... Uh, I don't know if it's really got what's got on the atonement in here. I'll definitely have to look over this in the next couple of days, or in the future, whenever I... Let's see... Hmm. There's salvation... He has like the extent of salvation where he talks about limited or unlimited atonement and obviously the bible teaches unlimited atonement because limited atonement is basically a calvin calvinistic exclusive doctrine uh, so maybe he really doesn't go into a lot of the atonement i'm not sure i'm sure that there's other books that i got that do there's a lot online that i just have to go through but 923. Hmm. Might have to look. And I guess that penal substitutionary tone, that penal means punishment. So. It has to do with the fact that Jesus was a substitute for our punishment. Hmm. Well, I'm just uh, looking around. Might not really be much about that in here. Hmm. 
apa the only thing that has penal in here is the penalty of sin that's the closest it's Anyway, there's just a lot of various views on there, so think about how the atonement affects the gospel, and um, what does the Bible mean when it talks about justice, and uh, there's also this idea, you know, that sin separates us from God, it's a very popular uh, saying, but I don't know if that's true either, that's makes it really interesting, uh, because... You know, for one, I mean, by, or God is omnipresent. He's everywhere. He can't be contained or anything. Um, and there's an idea that if we were actually literally separated from God, that we would be outside of God. Okay, we would, we'd be outside of Him, and it'd be like it'd be like we were like gods ourselves. Um, so God has control over everything that He has created. And, you know, the Bible definitely teaches that, you know, that our minds or our hearts can be separated from God. Uh, but to literally be separated from God, in the, in the sense that a lot of people say, I don't think it's accurate. And there's this idea of, you know, when, when Jesus suffered God's wrath on the cross, supposedly, uh, that he was separated from the Father momentarily or whatever. That's why he cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And that's just stupid to me because you can't separate the Father from the Son. And uh, so the whole separation from sin thing, that might be flawed too. So, or sep or I mean, sin separating man from God. Um in some senses, yes, but literally actually being separated from God, like 100%, no. Uh, but separated, you know, in the way that we live, the way that we think and stuff, sure. So, anyway, there's that. I'll see you think on all that. God bless.